everybody, it's Grandmaster Ben Feingold with another Great Players of the Past. Let's see, who's the great player today? Ah, Boris Baski. Uh, Boris Baski was the 10th world champion. Um, let's see, was I the 9th or the 11th? Oh, I, that's right, I was never world champion. Um, hopefully you uh, enjoy these videos we bring you at the Chess Club and Scholastic Center of Atlanta. Now, normally, our sponsor, our patron, his name is Anonymous, but we have a new sponsor today, Jamie Gregora. In fact, the, the sponsorship was so good, he changed his name to James. That's, I mean, that's when you know things are, you know, yeah. <clears throat> so Boris Spassky, unfortunately, is famous for losing a match to Fisher, um, which is unfortunate because he should be famous for other stuff. Um, he played in three world championship matches, played in 1966, losing to Petrosian. Then he played him again in 69, the year that I was born, and then he won. And then in 72, of course, he, he lost the famous match to Bobby Fischer. Um, Spassky in the mid-70s decided he had enough of Soviet Russia, and he moved to France. Um, and then he eventually married a French woman. Um, I learned a lot by reading the Wikipedia article on Spassky. For example, his sister was the Russian Drots champion for women like four times, and she was second in the international championship. So didn't play chess, but, but played, you know, some form of checkers. Um, Spassky played in a lot of Olympic teams for the Soviet Union and then for France and world team championships. And he played in many Super Grandmaster tournaments. And unlike a lot of top players, Spassky was good in the 50s, 60s, 70s, and 80s. And maybe some people would say 90s. I mean, he was okay in the 90s, but he wasn't, you know, wasn't one of the top 10 players in the world. Um, he was a world championship candidate on seven occasions. The first time in 56. And the, sec and the last time in 1985. So that's uh, amazing that he was such a strong player. And Spassky had a universal style. He could beat you any possible way. And he basically beat all the world champions, you know, that were around in his lifetime. He, he beat everybody. You name a world champion, he beat them. Um, now, if Spassky wasn't born yet, that would be a good excuse for not beating. It's not a great excuse, but it's pretty good. Um, now, there is a very strange happenstance, which I don't understand. Uh, in around 2012, uh, Spassky moved back from France to, to Russia, where he lives now, and he claimed he was being held against his will in France, and he was being drugged, and he had to escape. I don't know. Uh, very suspicious. Um, Spassky is the oldest living ex-world champion. He's 84 years old, but he hasn't played competitively in you know, probably like 20 years. And when Spassky was playing chess in the 90s and 2000s, mostly he was taking quick draws. He wanted to go play tennis. He wasn't, you know, like fierce. He was, you know, he was relaxing. And many famous Spassky stories um, which they don't talk about on Wikipedia, but I have inside information. Um, when he gave simultaneous exhibitions, unlike somebody like me, he would give draws out all the time that you could tell your friends you drew Spassky because the game would go like 10 moves. And if you offered him a draw, he's like, sure. Okay, and if people offer me to draw, I, I call the police. And the reason is I like the way Sting sings, really good singer, okay, and then I say no. <clears throat> Patrick's getting confused over there. Okay. Um, Spassky played so many great games, I didn't know what to do. So I decided not to look at any games at all and just have 55 minutes of silence. No, no, I didn't do that. I picked three games, but I could have picked like 300. So many great games because he beat everybody. Beat Fisher, Karpov, Kasparov, and those were the weak players that he beat. That's how good he was. Now, one of Spassky's most famous games uh, was actually shown in a movie 
I'm sure it's your favorite movie, From Russia with Love. Okay, one of the first James Bond movies. And it's the opening scene of the movie, and the person who's supposed to be Bronstein, his name is Kronstein. Very suspicious. Now, I've heard two stories. I don't know which one to believe. I'll let you guys decide which one you want to believe. The first story is the reason the game in the movie isn't exactly like the actual game is the director thought that the game that they put up looked better, and he was the director. He said, take those pawns off. I don't like the way that looks. That's one story. The other story is they were afraid they were going to get sued if they showed the exact game because they thought maybe the game could be copyrighted and they're not allowed to show the exact same game. So they took a pawn or two off so they can't complain. Which story is true? They're probably both wrong, but they're good stories. And in the end, isn't that the real truth? The answer is no. Okay, so that's the first game we're going to look at is the spasky Bronstein game. Now, I did a lot of research. If you guys thought that I was sleeping and then I was napping and then I had some food and then I took another nap, you were wrong. That's not what I did. Or wait a minute. No, what I did was I did research. Okay, and my research showed in slow chess, Bronstein never beat Spassky. And they played about 22 times. Okay, and Bronstein was pretty good. You know how good Bronstein was? He only lost to me once. That's how good he was. And, uh, and Spassky never lost to me. So. Um, however, Bronstein did win one game in a blitz tournament. So there you go. Um, Spassky could beat you every possible way. He could have a checkmating attack. That was his preferred way. He could beat you with slow maneuvering. He could beat you with opening prep. He could win a 90-move endgame as long as he won and got to play tennis later. Now, Spassky was very lucky because after he was world champion, when he lost to Fisher, he played in the candidate cycle to see who would play the next you know, match. That cycle, as you know, was won by Karpov. And Karpov actually played Spassky in one of the cycles, and Spassky won the first game, but then Karpov ended up winning the match. But more importantly, uh, in the first match that Spassky played in the candidate cycle after he was world champion was against Robert Byrne. And the reason that's important is Robert Byrne loved to play tennis, and Boris Spassky loves to play tennis. After their candidates game, they would go play tennis together. Okay, that, people don't do that now. They don't hang out with each other. But I think at that time, I could be wrong because I was like four years old. I think most people didn't think the match would be super competitive. I think Spassky was going to beat Robert Byrne. So maybe Byrne's like, you know, I'll play some tennis, whatever. I'm probably not going to win anyway. So maybe he won in tennis. I don't know. Okay, now if you've seen the movie From Russia with Love, this is the opening scene of the movie is the end of this game with some slight modifications. Like Bronstein is called Kronstein. Also, I think he's white. Okay, so let's, let's do it. Um, you guys can see the moves on the board. Really? No. Okay, so Spassky, one of the few grandmaster, super grandmaster world champions who played the King's Gambit you know, after the year 1900. Um, and in fact, in the 1980s, 90s, and 2000s, probably just Spassky and Judah Polgar. Occasionally, Nigel Short would play it, but he was kidding. But Judah Polgar and Spassky weren't kidding. They played the King's Gambit all the time, okay? And Judith stopped playing it after a while. Not because she lost to me in the King's Gambit, but she did, but that's not why. Um, so the King's Gambit is like the Queen's Gambit, except White's King is a little more exposed. But you're trying to get the center by trading a side pawn for a center pawn. Bronstein always plays the most aggressive. Okay? And what's funny is Bronstein plays a line that I play today. And I learned this line in 1988, uh, or maybe it was 87. There was a game... Mark Hebden, John Nunn, they're both British 
grandmasters, although Hebden wasn't a grandmaster at the time, and Nunn won with black very convincingly, and I liked the way Nunn played, so I play like that. Luckily, Hebden didn't play like Spassky, so. Okay, and that's d5 early. That's considered like the safest line. You get rid of white center pawn. Both sides sacrifice a pawn, and they just start developing their pieces. Okay, terrible developing their pieces. How could they? Okay, and black plays h6 for a very strange reason. Um, and if you ever see the game Hebgen versus Nun, which was played, let's see, what is it, 34 years ago? Um, in that game, black played a very early g5, which seems a little dangerous. And then this bishop never got out, and eventually black got the king's side attack with his pieces and pawns. I like that game, although I probably should look at it after 34 years. Also, it stops knight g5, so sort of a safe move. Knight e4, he says thanks for the pawn. c4, knight to e3, and white must be happy now because white has a lead in development and he's down a pawn. That's what the king's gambit's all about. Okay, white has all his minor pieces out. I don't know how this bishop's ever going to get out. Uh, white has nice center control. Very good pieces in the center. Probably this e pawn is going to go away. That's probably not going to stay there forever. Um, and if white has to, he can get his rook into the game pretty quickly, and black uh, cannot. Now, what's funny is probably one of the problems Bronstein had playing Spassky is Spassky played like Bronstein, but better. Bronstein liked to sacrifice material and attack also. So if Spassky was doing that, Bronstein probably wanted to switch sides. Like, I want to have white here. I, I like to do that. So psychologically crushing. Okay, c5, the bishop retreats. Bishop c2, can somebody who's watching live, I know you're watching on YouTube after the fact and you're yelling at your computer. Stop doing that. Can somebody watching live tell me why white played bishop to c2? Like room for the queen. Yeah, white wants to play queen d3 and give the checkmate that we all love. Okay, so rook e8, queen d3. And what black played the move e2, trying to confuse white. Knight f6 check doesn't work to play queen here, mate, because knight takes knight, the knight defends h7. The rook's hanging, and if the queen takes the pawn, then the queen's lined up with black's rook, and it's off this diagonal. So Bronstein thought e2 would be a good distracting move. He's like, I'll play e2, white's going to do something about his rook, and then we'll continue. Okay, but this game is famous, it made it into a movie, so if Bronstein had known that, he would have played something more boring, I guess. And hopefully some of you know this game, and since there's thousands of people watching after the fact on YouTube, and there's only like five people watching now, hopefully YouTube people, you guys can look it up after the fact. Um, and here Bronstein played a move, and I, was it Soltis? He said this is the deepest combination ever played, and then he got a lot of flack on the internet, so... Um, see, when the game was played, there was no internet, so Spassky could, you know, play the greatest move ever. Okay, so he played knight d6, ignoring his rook, threatening queen h7 with, with mate to come. Okay, so you can't take the knight, because queen h7, queen h8 mate, obviously, is, is going to be checkmate. So, Bronstein played knight f8. I mean, you could take the rook and white would replace it with his other rook, and it would be sort of like the game. And obviously, Bronstein doesn't want to get checkmated, so he played knight f8, and he thought, I'm still threatening pawn takes rook. Okay, and Spassky's like, yeah, yeah, pawn takes rook. I don't care about that. So, uh, obviously, white has a vicious attack, and all of black's pieces, except his bishop on e7, are on the back row. That's not very aggressive. Okay, and then Bronstein's like, all right, I'll, you know, I'll, I'll take that. I'll, I'll be a rook up while I'm at it. So now white's threatening, knight takes queen, and king takes 
uh, F7 looks incredibly dangerous walking into this discovered double, triple, quadruple check, and then Bishop here is check, and so forth. And black doesn't really need that knight because black's already up a rook. Black just has to not get mated. Then black's up a rook. Then he'll win. So black has to figure out the safest thing to do. But first things first, you have to save your queen. If white plays knight takes queen, he'll win. If white checkmates you, he'll win. So Bronstein has to find a good defensive move. He plays bishop f5. He doesn't mind losing a bishop as long as he doesn't get checkmated. Obviously, Spassky doesn't want to trade queens, so he didn't play knight takes queen, bishop takes queen. He just took the bishop, and then queen to d7. So black is still up material. He's threatening to trade queens, and he figures he can stop the attack. His rooks are connected, and maybe everything is okay. Or maybe not. Okay, then queen f4, white doesn't want to trade queens. And he's like, all right, I'm going to play knight e5 next move, attacking a queen, continuing the attack. And basically, this is one of the first super grandmaster games where we learn something that we still teach today. And that is, when there's opposite colored bishops, that's a big advantage for the attacking side. Okay, And since black has his pawns on the dark squares... On the king's side, there's nothing defending the white squares. And he doesn't have a white squared bishop. White has a white squared bishop, but black doesn't. So this should be winning for white. White's only down the exchange. He's dominating the white squares. He's attacking the king. And this rook is you know, shallow and pedantic, obviously. OK, bishop f6, defending, attacking the knight on f7. Blocking the queen. Knight e5, defending the knight on f7, attacking the queen. Queen to e7, saving his queen. Bishop to b3, threatening a plethora of discovered checks. Lots of discovered checks. He takes the knight. The knight takes with check. King to h7, escaping the check. Queen e4 check. And in this position, Black decided to resign. Um, it doesn't matter what he does. If he blocks with the knight, I just take it for free. If he plays g6, rook f7 check, wins the queen. And if he plays king to h8, there's more than one way to win. I think rook takes knight check wins, followed by knight g6. I think knight f7 check. Um, let's see, knight f7 check right away might not win because queen takes knight. Right. So he resigned, but king h8, um, I don't see what to do against this. I could resign. That's a good move. Yeah, if you take with the queen, I check. You have one legal move, and this is double check. And then this is mate. So that would be bad. And if you take with the rook, it's even worse. It's actually the same. I, I don't take your queen, which wins because I have mate in two. That's double check, and then it's the same mate. So he just resigned. Now, if you saw from Russia with Love, and I've seen it several times, it's, I think, one of the top three or four James Bond movies. Um, very suspicious scene. So the guy who's white in the movie, he's a secret agent. And he gets coffee delivered. I think it was coffee. It might have been food. And there's a note. And he reads the note, and he's like, you got to go do your secret agent stuff. So he has to win really fast, because he's got to go. And he wins the game really fast, and then everybody claps, and his opponent stands up and shakes his hand and claps. Now, you guys play chess, you guys here. Does your opponent ever stand up and clap when you beat them? No, usually they throw things and they swear. Yeah, that's... <clears throat> but in the movie, it was a very gentlemanly, like, you know, well done, excellent. Yeah, now there's a famous story, and I've actually seen the video, and if you saw the movie Pawn Sacrifice, I'm not sure if you saw it, <clears throat> when one of the games, when Fisher beats Spassky in the match, the 72 match, Spassky's clapping for Fisher after the game. 
because he was a good sport. Okay, we don't see that a lot right now. So as a consequence of uh, Spassky being a good sport, there was one award he never won. He never won the Nakamura Sportsmanship Award. That's unfortunate. But, you know, maybe at some point later. Okay. I mean, he could still play chess, I guess. I don't know. All right. Let's see if F11 works. It does. Okay. The next game is against Larry Evans. Okay. Larry Evans played in about 20 U.S. championships, and he was one of the top five or six players in the U.S. between, like, 1958 and 1974, somewhere in there. And uh, he wrote some chess books. He gave a lot of chess lessons. He played a lot of Olympics uh, for the U.S., and he was one of the top players. And he was known for... Uh, taking sacrificed material and saying, oh boy, I'm up material, like today's Yasser Sarawan. <clears throat> now, the confusing thing about Larry Evans, okay, now you got to write this down so you're not confused. There's a gambit you've all heard of called the Evans Gambit. Okay, that's not him. That's another Evans. That's Captain William Evans from before you were born. Okay, that's a long time ago. He wasn't a grandmaster, he was a ship captain, and he sacrificed material. This Evans never sacrificed material. He said, give me your material. So if, if ever there's time travel is perfected, I'm working on it, we could have the Evans-Evans match, and the old Evans will sacrifice, and the new Evans will be like, oh boy, and then they'll have a really good match. Okay, so this is a different Evans, but all right. Now, Spassky was one of the first world champions to what we call in the business, I'm giving away a trade secret here, to play with the right hand and the left hand. Okay, the right hand is E4 and the left hand is D4. And normally most people just play one or the other because if you play both, you got to know a lot of theory. On the other hand, if you play both, your opponent doesn't know what you're going to do on move one. Spassky has a lot of brilliant wins with e4 and also with d4. Okay? In fact, we just looked at an e4 game. Here's a d4 game. Okay, so he's playing Evans, and Evans plays the King's Gambit, a uh, King's Indian. I was close. Maybe they can fix that in editing. And yeah, Spassky didn't really care what opening he played. It was all the same-ish to him. Anybody? No? Okay, so he played F3. Breaking my rule, never play F3. However, he could break the rule because I wasn't born yet. So that's, that's okay. Okay, the same-ish king is Indian. And Evans played what's called the burn defense because Evans and Burn were like that. They were teammates, and this was an Olympiad in Bulgaria, and this was, you know, the Soviet Union versus America. And probably Evans and Byrne studied together because they played for the American team. And so Robert Byrne liked to play C6, A6, B5. That's what he did against the Samish. Okay? And Evans is like, all right. My teammate must know it. It's named after him. And Spassky Castle Queenside, which is very dangerous because Black's already moved his pawns there. Now we're going to have an opposite side castling game with checkmating themes. Now, Evans was a very good player when it was really boring, but it was really exciting. Then Spassky was a much better player. Okay, and so it got really exciting. H4, D5. And Evans is like, oh boy, I love winning pawns. I'm Larry Evans. And Spassky is like, I like checkmating my opponent. I'm, I'm more Spassky. He's like, take all the pawns you want. Now... Again, there's a philosophy, which I somewhat agree with, which is, you know, if you don't see anything happening, take everything. That was definitely Evan's philosophy. Take everything. Okay? Now, if you see the guys mating you, then you probably should stop it. But if you don't see the guys mating you, take everything. And unfortunately, Spassky saw more than Evans did. That's why this lecture is on Spassky and not on Evans. So he keeps taking, 
and, and, he, and he keeps taking. He's like, yay. So Evans is pretty happy because he took everything. So if Evans doesn't get checkmated, he'll win because he's up like 500 pawns. Okay. Also, he's threatening to promote to a queen and take a rook. That's a pretty good threat. And rook h4 was played. Spassky didn't want to take with the queen on g2. Spassky wants the queen to go to h6. The pawn on g2 he doesn't care about. Okay, so, so Evan's development isn't too good. He's greedy. He's winning a lot of pawns, but he's, he's got nothing developed. And white's threatening. Bishop takes g7, queen h6 check, etc. mainly etc. Okay, so Evans plays knight g4, defending the h6 square. So now if we trade on, on g7, you can't play queen h6 because my knight's there. If you take my knight, then your queen won't be defended by the rook. So Evans is like, you're not going to meet me. I'm going to be up a million pawns and so forth. Okay, that's what Evans was hoping for. Takes, takes. Queen takes g2, threatening the knight on g4. So gaining a tempo. And he retreats the knight. Uh, if he plays the move knight e3, which forks the queen and the rook, I guess white could play queen g5, and then queen h6 and queen takes knight are threats. So he decided not to get mated. Knight f3, a la Morphy, getting the last piece developed, and he's ready to double rooks on the h file. Now, I don't know about grandmasters in the 60s, um, I was born in 1969, but I was born late in the year, so I didn't, you know. But I'm guessing uh, grandmasters today would not take the black pieces here. This looks really scary to me. I don't like black's position. I do like being two pawns ahead, but I don't like getting checkmated. And I don't like the fact that we're so deep into the game and those pieces haven't moved yet. Also, the fact that I'm playing Spassky, I, I don't like either. Okay, so he played knife f5, attacking the rook. Always retreat. Knight e5. Knight e4. I mean, white's pieces are just too good. Doubles the rooks, threatening mate in three. Rook h7, rook h8. The other rook to h7. So he plays rook g8, so his king can run away to safety. The king runs away to safety. Rook takes... And now, if I was black, I would resign here, if I was black, because then I could set my pieces up for the next game pretty quickly. I already got these three guys all set, right? Then this guy goes here, this guy goes here. I could, I could leave the tournament area pretty quickly. Yeah. All right. Now, if you weren't a fan of Spassky before this game, you'll become one now. Spassky played two brilliant moves in a row, so the game didn't go much longer. Can anybody guess what Spassky played here? You have to unmute yourself, otherwise it's confusing. Uh, queen takes g6? Queen takes g6 is correct. And the reason is, if you take it, we got some back rank checkmate. And the king can never go to d7 because of the knight, so knight f8 doesn't help. So we can play like an engine, but like this is made and this is made. I don't know which is more brutal. I, I particularly find that one more brutal, but that's, uh, I could be wrong. Okay, so after queen takes g6, if this game was played today, every grandmaster would resign with black. It's a good thing he didn't resign, because then we get to see more fireworks. He played knight takes e5. And then Spassky gave him the sugar me do again. Queen takes g6 was the first brilliant move. What's the second one? Rook f8. Rook f8. Obviously, queen takes rook check wins, but yeah. rook f8 wins more. Okay, so black has two legal moves. Okay, he's got king d7 and king takes rook. King takes rook, we have checkmate. It's funny, this checkmating attack looks like Spassky Bronstein. White squared bishop. All right. And if king d7, I guess queen here is mate, bishop here is mate, and knight here is mate. Oh, you know what? 
Queen E8 is made, I think. Yeah. That sounds like a good time to resign. Right. Now, this looks like a game played in a simultaneous exhibition. But Black was Larry Evans, one of the top American players forever. Okay, but not a world champion. World champion's different. And I've told this story before, but I like stories. Arthur Bisgeyer, who said a lot of crazy time in his, a lot of crazy things in his life, he said something that was really true. It was the truest thing ever. Nobody's ever said anything more true. He said, a weak grandmaster, and Evans is not a weak grandmaster. He said, a weak grandmaster, I don't know who he's talking about. Anybody else here? <clears throat> he said, a weak grandmaster is closer in strength to a 2100 player than a world champion. That, that is correct. So when you see grandmasters you haven't heard of or you've barely heard of who were not candidates, who weren't playing for the world championship, who weren't top 10 in the world, when they play Carlson, Kaspara, Fisher, Karpov, Spassky, uh, sometimes they get beat really badly, really badly, because they're just not in the same league. Evans was about the same league, but not quite, as you can see. Like, this looks like the beating of a lifetime. This is terrible. Okay, but again, this is Spassky lecture. And Evans lecture, he might even win some games. Probably not. Okay. And last but not least, now, I couldn't believe when I did my research that I found this game. I, I, I don't even know what to say. So... In 1990, I'm close, I'm within two years, I played in the Vikanze uh, B group, and they have a chess festival. They have an A group, they have a B group, they have an open tournament, etc. And the open tournament has a lot of people. And every year, and this is, again, this is over 30 years ago, they have a, uh, a brilliancy prize for the whole chess festival. And I won. I beat a Dutch I am. I sacrificed all my pieces. His king ran around the board like this. And eventually I won. And you can find this game, you know, I've lectured on this game like five times. His name is Gert Jan de Boer. And as you all know, de Boer is farmer, ergo the, the, the Boer Wars. See? Right? You guys agree? Patrick's getting a history lesson. The adults are getting one too. Okay, and the reason I'm shocked about this, the guy that I played was a Dutchman, and he knew the games of Timon, the guy who has black in this game. And Timon was one of the top 10 players in the world in between like, I don't know, 1975 and 1995, somewhere in there. Um, and when my game ended with De Boer, I found a Timon game that went the same way my game did, except at the point where we deviated, Timon won three moves later with black, and I won with white. So I was glad I didn't play Timon. And this guy knew all of Timon's games and analysis. Maybe he looked at it with him because they're both Dutch, I don't know. And it turned out this game, which I didn't know before today, this is the same line. So I think this is where Timon gets crushed, then Timon improves on his play and wins, and then I improve on the guy who got crushed by Timon, and I won. Now the ball's in Timon's court, but he's, I mean, he's pretty old, so too bad, Timon. Okay, so they played a Grunfeld. This is the Grunfeld, and Spassky always plays the same way. He plays the classical, you know, you, you get the big center, and nowadays, people are playing bishop e3 and queen d2, or bishop e3 and moving their rook, or knight f3. But Spassky played the old way because his games were old. He was playing chess in the 50s, 60s, 70s. So Spassky always played bishop c4, knight e2. I almost never play bishop c4, knight e2, but I did play at this one game with De Boer that I was telling you about. And in this position... Everybody plays c5. And if you look at a database, there's 8,000 Grandmaster games with c5. And there's a lot of Karpov-Kasparov games 
from their like 87 match and maybe from other matches. And there's, there's just many, 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 many games. The latest game that I know of was Geary versus Carlson about a year ago, and Geary was winning, but since it was Geary, it ended in a draw. Okay, and Timon played B6. This is what DeBoer played against me, and that was the end of my theoretical knowledge. I knew nothing at this point, but I did know how to put it in H. Even 30 years ago, I could put it in H. So H4. Okay, now DeBoer surprised me, but this is the normal move. I just didn't know the variation. He played knight c6. Timon's played this more than once. And the idea is white's bishop on this diagonal, that was, that was the drunken diagonal. Sorry about that. Whoa. And the lecture ends because I broke the computer. No, I'm kidding. Okay, so there's the diagonal. Uh, black doesn't like that because white's going to play h5 and take and knight f4 and take, and black wants to get rid of this bishop, so black's going to play knight a5 and put the bishop on d3 where it does nothing. Okay, and Spassky played bishop d5, just like I did. Queen to d7, defending the knight, h5, bishop a6. This is also my game with DeBoer. Takes, takes. Now, I didn't know this game until today, even though I had this position... 31 years ago, and I played bishop to h6, which Timon has also faced. Okay, and Spassky didn't play bishop h6. Spassky got right down to business. Spassky played knight f4. He wants to play knight takes g6 because the f pawn is pinned. Okay, and Spassky is a very straightforward player. Normally, if you analyze Spassky games, when the game's over, you're like, yeah, Spassky beat that guy pretty good. That guy's no good. Spassky crushed that guy. There are some players, when you analyze their games, you're like, I don't understand this move. I don't understand this move. In the games that I'm showing you today, Spassky just runs over his opponents. He just totally crushes them, and you understand. And you don't understand how he beats strong players so easily. That's a different question, because Timon's pretty good. Okay, Timon played e6, because that stops knight takes g6. And Spassky didn't go backwards, he went forwards. What move can white play here that goes forwards and doesn't lose the bishop on d5? Tough question. Spassky always bringing more pieces into the attack. Bishop to x3. Bishop to a3, although you would lose your bishop on d5. Oh, yeah, okay. Think more going towards the king. You guys can do it. Queen g4. Queen g4, that's right. You can't take the bishop now because the pawn's pinned. Your queen would be attacked. Now, white's ready to do something Knight g6, knight e6, bishop e6. Probably knight e6 in this position. Okay, so Timon played rook d8, defending his queen, and now he's threatening pawn takes bishop. So, yeah. And Spassky played bishop takes e6. Now, the problem with knight takes e6, which is definitely what I would play in a blitz game, I would never play bishop e6. That wouldn't even occur to me. Problem with 96 is, is that was an interesting noise. Uh, I actually know what that noise was. The problem with knight takes e6 is the knight's pinned. So he can't move the knight again because his queen on g4 would be hanging. Although, to be honest, I'm, I'm not sure what black would do there. I guess he could play rook e8. Maybe rook e8 is good. Hmm. Yeah, actually, I like rook e8. Maybe that's good. Yeah. All right. So he played bishop e6. And this is a tactic that a lot of people miss. And, the, and I've talked about this on many of my videos and streams. 
One day, somebody will listen. Maybe not today, maybe not tomorrow, but someday and soon. Right, Patrick, your favorite movie, Casablanca, because it sounds like Capablanca. When somebody does something, the focus of most people's analysis is on that square. So after bishop takes e6, if you had the black pieces and you were analyzing that move, you would be like, all right, pawn takes, queen takes, trading queens. I'm not afraid of that. Pawn takes, knight takes, the knight's pinned. I'm not afraid of that. But the point of bishop e6 isn't to keep taking on e6. It's to weaken the g6 pawn. Obviously, the queen's attacked, so you have to take, and now I take the g6 pawn. And now you can see white has a lot of attack. There's lots of attack going on here. And you can also see black's pieces are over here. So there's a very good chance that white's going to be successful. Bishop c4 defending his pawn on e6. Otherwise, knight takes e6, wins even more. Check, move the king. Knight h5 attacks the bishop. So rook g8 is forced. Rook h3. Threatening rook f3 check. Spassky uses all of his pieces to attack. And Yasser Sarawan in 1985 told me Spassky likes to play classical chess. He likes to put his pawns in the center. Spassky loves when his pawns are here. And when he attacks, he uses all of his pieces Morphe style. Rook f8. Knight takes g7. You have to, well, you have to take it in theory, but not in practice. If you take this, I can check. The king can't go to e7 because the rook on g7 is hanging. You have to go here. Takes, takes, and then bishop h6. And there's no defense to like queen h8 check. Man, truth hurts. And white's not even down material here. So he plays rook h8 instead. And this looks like it staves off the attack. Now, the difference between class players who were attacking and world champions who were attacking, you know, like Tal and Spassky and Fisher and Kasparov, is they figure it all out. They don't go, hmm, rook h8, now what do I do? And then either they have a good move or they don't. So sometimes they're lucky, sometimes they're not. When you're a world champion, you don't go, oh, I didn't see all these defensive moves, now what do I do? You have to figure it out beforehand. Okay, that's why they become the world champion. Okay, Rick F3 is pretty obvious. King E7 is legal, so he played it. Recommended by the engine, because it's legal. So you gotta like that. Bishop A3 check. That's a very difficult move to see if you have the black pieces because you're concentrating looking on the king side. So looking on the queen side is really difficult. Although it is check. If your opponent puts you in check, you should see it. The, now bishop g5 check probably also wins. Then the king can escape to d6. Now there is no escape. Knight b4 was played, but that's silly. Um, Unfortunately, if you play the normal move, then your pieces all disappear. So that's, it whites up a rook. So that's, you can't, you can't do that. Okay, so you have to play knight b4, you can't be down a rook, and then c5. Now, it looks like Timon has everything under control. The queen on h7 is hanging, the bishop on b4 is hanging, and black king is ready to run away. So Spassky resigned. Oh, no, wait a minute. This is a Spassky lecture. That's not what happened. Yeah, Spassky had it all figured out. He just took the pawn, ignoring his queen. Amazing. He has to take the queen. There's no other move. Nothing else to do. And now, when I was playing the game over, I was like, all right, c6 check and white wins back his queen, and I'm still confused because the knight's hanging on g7, and rook here check is a skewer. So I was like, I don't know. Ah, I'm not good enough to figure this out. 
But Spassky did not play C6 check. What did Spassky play? I mean, C6 check is so obvious, but he didn't do it. Rook to D1. Well, then Rook H1 is checkmate. So at least the game ends in checkmate. Is C takes B6 check? C takes B6 check. The reason is, where does the king go? There's only one legal square, D8, and then the king can't go to C7 because the pawn's on B6. So you have to go here, and all your pieces are gone. White's up too many pieces to understand. I can't understand it. So you can't play king d8, so you have to play queen d6, I guess. And now everything wins. Uh, my favorite win is takes, takes, and then I'm not saying Spassky would do this, but I would. Castle with check. That way there's no rook h1 check winning my rook. Now your rook's hanging, so you have to defend it. And then the b-pawn queens. Doesn't matter takes are here. The truth hurts. So after C takes B6 check, in this position, Timon resigned. Amazing. Uh, I mean, my game won a brilliancy prize, but it wasn't 10% as good as this game. Luckily, Spassky wasn't playing in my event, so I didn't have any trouble. And normally, the kind of brilliant attacking games I show you from Spassky, you would expect that when a super grandmaster or world champion plays a lesser, you know, an IM, an FM, maybe even worse, but not somebody who's top 10 in the world, just makes them look silly. And Spassky did that quite often. That's why Spassky played in three world championship matches, because he was no joke. And unfortunately, throughout the history of time, Spassky is going to be remembered by a lot of people for the guy who lost to Fisher. That's, that's too bad, because Spassky was pretty good. In fact, on Fisher's top 10 list, which some people may not agree with, he had Spassky as one of the top 10 players ever. So he had a, well, Spassky was a great player. And before the Fisher-Spassky match in 72, Fisher had never beaten Spassky. So Spassky had his number un until the world championship. Then he didn't. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed those Spassky games. If you go to the internets, um, the Wikipedia article on Spassky is very long because the better you are at chess, the longer your Wikipedia article is. My, my article is not long. And there's also several books written by Spassky and about Spassky. So there's dozens and dozens of great games like this. This lecture is only 45 minutes to an hour, so I couldn't show you like his 200 best games. But... I could show you 200 best games. This guy's an amazing player. Really great attacking player. Great opening theoretician. Uh, really solid. And was good for, for many, many years. 50s, 60s, 70s, and 80s, he was a top player. Well, I hope you enjoyed this video, especially if you're watching on YouTube. Thanks for joining us at the Chess Club and Scholastic Center of Atlanta. Please like and subscribe and click on the next videos I'm Grandmaster Ben Feingold. Once again, we want to thank our sponsor, Jamie Gregora. Yay. Just like if I lost to him at chess. Yay. Good job. Good. You crushed me. And I'll see you guys next time. Bye.